Hi, and welcome back to First Year Undergraduate Microeconomics. In the last few presentations, we've been looking at applications of welfare economics. In this presentation, we're going to go past the standard first year undergraduate course and look at some of the traps of welfare economics. We're going to focus on an example which involves multiple markets, and in doing so, we're going to highlight some hidden assumptions of welfare economics. So, here's our example. Suppose apples and oranges are substitutes. The government puts a sales tax on apples. How do we measure the change in consumer and producer surplus? Well, that sounds easy. We've done this before. Quantity of the apples on the horizontal axis, price on the vertical axis, demand for apples, supply for apples, initial equilibrium price and initial equilibrium quantity. Let's put the tax on there. So it's going to be a tax of T dollars and we have our new sales tax equilibrium. In that equilibrium, we have a quantity QT, a price to sellers of PS, and a price to buyers of PD. And what's the change in consumer surplus? What's the change in producer surplus? And what's the change in welfare? Well, let's do it really quickly. In the absence of a tax, consumer surplus is A plus B plus C. Producer surplus is D plus E plus F. And total social surplus is A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. With the tax, consumer surplus is reduced to area A. Producer surplus is reduced to area F. Of course, the government gets some revenue, B plus D. But total social surplus has fallen to A plus B plus D plus F. So our deadweight loss is the loss of social surplus, C plus area E. We've all done that before, and we've stopped there. But what about the orange market? Here's our orange market before a tax is introduced on apples. We have quantity of oranges, we have price of oranges, we have demand and supply for oranges, and we have our initial equilibrium in the orange market. If a tax on apples pushes up the price of apples, and apples and oranges are substitutes, then we would expect that the increase in the price of apples will increase the demand for oranges. It will shift the demand curve for oranges to the right, it will increase the price of oranges, and it will increase the number of oranges transacted. Nothing new there. But what about if we start asking about the social surplus in oranges? Notice how if we look at the social surplus, the area under the demand curve, above the supply curve, up to the quantity transacted, it looks as if the tax on apples has increased the social surplus in the orange market. Our social surplus triangle looks like it's got bigger. We've got more oranges traded, the demand curve has shifted to the right, so surely we've now got more social surplus in the orange market. Oops, hang on a second. When we're considering the deadweight loss of a sales tax, how come we didn't look at this increase in social surplus in the orange market? Surely we've made a mistake here. No. When you look at a tax on the apple market, you've actually taken into account already all the effects on all other markets. You don't have to look at those other markets individually. Now that makes life really simple. Imagine if you actually had to think of the change of social surplus individually in every other market just to analyse the effects of a tax on apples. You wouldn't be able to do it in a lifetime. So fortunately, we don't have to do that. It would be an error to start trying to measure social surplus looking at the market for complements and the market for substitutes. All the changes in social surplus are already taken into account in the one market. Now, in later courses in economics, you'll learn why that's the case. But it comes back to our measure of consumer surplus based on compensation. How much do you have to compensate a consumer if you take away the goods from them? And it reflects that producer surplus is closely related to profits. That's well past this course, 
but it's really important to understand the principle because it's one that a lot of students make a mistake about. So to summarise, we only have to consider the market directly affected by the change to work out the change in social surplus. Or to put it simply, if you want to know the change in social surplus due to a policy that affects the Apple market, you only have to look at the Apple market. So everything we've done up until now has been perfectly correct. Whew, that's a relief. Well, it's been perfectly correct if we make another assumption. That other assumption is not just that the Apple market is perfectly competitive, but that all other markets, the orange market, the banana market, any other relevant goods and services, that they also are bought and sold in perfectly competitive markets. That's been a hidden assumption that we've used so that we can just concentrate on our simple demand and supply diagrams and get accurate measures for changes due to change in government policy. But what if some other markets aren't perfectly competitive? What about, for example, if we have a monopoly seller in one market? As we're going to find out later on in this course, that's going to mean that the monopolist sets a price higher than the perfectly competitive price, and that leads to a deadweight loss. What about if the Apple market has a monopoly? Could we perhaps fix that up by distorting the orange market? If oranges and apples are substitutes, maybe we can subsidise oranges. That will reduce the demand for apples and reduce the effect of the monopoly deadweight loss. Those sort of policies where you fiddle with one market to try and fix up something in another market, something that's caused because another market isn't perfectly competitive, that's called the theory of the second best. So you have a use of policies, second best policies, where you may distort one market to try and fix up another market. Now, that's really hard because trying to balance out things that don't work properly you know, it's hard enough to try and balance out things that do work properly. How do we actually know which way things will be distorted? So there's also a theory of the third best, which says that when you get to the real world, life can be nasty and complex. Rather than trying to perfectly fix up every market, the best policy makers can do is try and work one market at a time. So the best we can do is the sort of analysis we've been using so far. According to the theory of the third best, don't try and use what are called second best policies to fix market distortions by distorting another market. That's more likely to lead to errors rather than improvements in the economy. Thanks for listening. You'll deal with a lot of this stuff in later courses, particularly if you do a later course on welfare economics. I recommend it to you. Thanks. Bye.